Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, Lunchtime Learning webinar, the next in our uh, Green New York series. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join us today on a topic that we've had a lot of requests for, so I'm really excited to have our presenter here today talking about it. Uh, I know it's uh, kind of a subsection of something we've talked about before with plastic pollution, uh, and I'm really excited to hear more about kind of the microplastic aspect of it. A couple housekeeping things as we get started today. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, you can find it on recording of it afterwards on the Green New York website. Um, in addition, everybody is on mute. If you have questions as we go along, please type them into the chat box and we will get to them at the end. So we will have time for questions, just type them in. In addition, uh, next month's webinar is taking place on August 11th, two, that's a Tuesday at noon, uh, and that is on greener garment cleaning featuring the folks from the Pollution Prevention Institute. So that promises to be a real webinar as well. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand it over to today's presenter, uh, Asher Pack from Institute for Rivers and Estuaries at Clarkson University. Thanks a lot for being here, Asher. Great. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks. Thank you for having me, and um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, this is a topic I've uh, spoken on quite a bit, um, began researching my, microplastics in the Hudson uh, in about uh, 2017. Um, and um, I think of myself just as, uh, you know, my background as a communicator. Um, I, uh, I don't do primary research uh, necessarily. I, I lead students in the field on, on field work on this uh, topic, but um, I don't publish on this necessarily. But I, I, what I do and what Beacon Institute does a lot um, is aggregate the scientific information coming out from a lot of sources and then try to um, put that in a digestible form for the public. So that's kind of how I see my role here. Um, so I, I, uh, I call this local solutions and, and watershed strategies. Um, and, you know, as Brendan mentioned, microplastics are inextricable from the plastic pollution issue. We are going to be focusing um, more kind of on the micro level um, and uh, we'll, we'll get into more kind of what those distinctions mean. So uh, I talked about the watershed level um, because if you're familiar with plastic pollution, you probably know that 80% uh, of plastic pollution tends to come from surface pollution. So our watersheds are these big basins which catch a ton of pollution that happens within them. Um, I hope that it probably seems like there are people uh, here today from across the state. And so, um, you know, your watershed, and I, I like to think about this in watershed terms and a lot of the issues in watershed terms because it makes it more manageable. Um, and it's something that citizen scientists and community members can, um, can do. They can help monitor these waterways and, and clean them up. So it's, it's kind of empowering. And so that's why I like to use that lens. Um, here's just an example of impaired waterways. Uh, this is from the DEC uh, website mapper. Um, I ask, you know, I'll just ask the group what you notice about this map. Um, you know, what you're probably uh, seeing is that, you know, the impaired waterways tend to be where the populations are. Um, and that's very true of microplastics as well, um, you know, with plastic pollution and, um, and the microplastics uh, incidents as well. Uh, just a bit of background about Clarkson University Beacon Institute. We're based in uh, Beacon, New York. Um, we, we do a lot of work here on Dennings Point. We're located in Dennings Point State Park. Um, we do public programs and P12 programs. Uh, we serve about 3,000 students and 3,000 visitors each year. Um, we do work uh, on microplastic field work with our high school students, and we do a lot of education around that. Um, Clarkson and uh, SUNY ESF um, were recently designated the New York State Center of Excellence in Healthy Water Solutions. Um, and I just wanted to note that um, we are expanding our uh, location here on Dennings Point with the new uh, environmental education complex, the construction beginning um, actually this week. Um, and so we're hoping that this will allow us to expand Clarkson's contributions to this area of um, emerging contaminants. Um, here's just an example of uh, students doing some microplastic field work. Uh, this was on Fishkill Creek here in the Hudson watershed. Um, students are using plankton nets to uh, to collect samples, and then they look at them in the in the uh, science lab. And uh, you'll see an example of films uh, which we found, um, which tend to be from degraded plastic bags. And so this was right in our own backyard. And as I mentioned, local solutions and watershed focus. This is something that. Um, you know, you can engage your, your local community and to really show 
um, where this problem exists. Another thing that we do here, we have um, an art gallery, um, again, on the theme of science communication. Um, and um, these are, this was from an art project um, that was communicating plastic pollution um, and uh, just a couple of the selections from that. So, you know, this problem is multifarious and so the solutions need to be as well. And arts and science uh, are, are really important to communicating these issues to the public and can be very powerful. So what is the, what, what is the scope of the problem here uh, in the Hudson? So I use the Hudson as, as the example um, because it is the, the water body that I um, focus on the most. Um, I've also looked at some of the research on the, the Mohawk River as well. Um, and, you know, based on, you know, population areas uh, near similarly large rivers across the state, um, you're, you're bound to see probably fairly similar uh, numbers there. Um, as you'll see from this, uh, there's a range um, in terms of the, the number of particles per square kilometer in, in the water column. Um, these numbers come from various organizations that have, that have studied uh, the, the water column. Uh, one I do want to highlight is the last one on this list, um, which is the Rosalia project, which found 300 million uh, microfibers per day estimated to be in the water column of the, the main stem of the Hudson River. Um, we'll come back to that later, but I just want folks to keep that, that microfibers in mind um, as, we, as we go forward. Um, one of the ways in which we uh, see what is floating in our rivers is uh, by doing beach cleanups. Um, here is some data from New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary Program. Um, just in terms of the common things that they find on the beaches here, this is very common to uh, beaches worldwide, as you've probably seen from um, you know, plastic pollution. Um, and so a lot of these would be considered um, macroplastics, um, but uh, as you'll see, microplastics come from uh, macroplastics. Microplastics uh, tend to degrade um, through weathering uh, once they end up in the, in the uh, environment and they become uh, microplastics. But just to show that these things, you know, uh, you, pictures that you've seen, you know, worldwide of kind of the ocean gyres that are full of plastic and that, you know, that exists here as well um, in the form of, it mostly ends up on the beaches, of course, because we have rivers. Um, these aren't sort of circular ocean currents, but they, they deposit um, these, uh, these particulates on our, our beaches. So I'm gonna skip ahead just a little bit and then go back. Um, so what are microplastics? So they tend to be uh, divided into about five categories. You have grains or beads. Uh, you have fibers uh, there. Films, which I mentioned, can tend to come from plastic bags, uh, fragments, and foams, right? So each one of these has different properties, and each one of them tends to come from a different kind of plastic. So there are about seven or eight um, predominant types of thermoplastics, as they're called. Um, thermoplastics are created by heating up granules of, um, of plastic, uh, uh, what they call nodules. Um, they're also called, they can be called mermaid tears, which is interesting, uh, but they're just tiny little beads of plastic and um, they heat them up and they form them into different shapes. Um, and that process uh, is what makes them so difficult to break down. Um, and it also, their uh, chemical composition uh, or the, their molecular composition kind of determines what kind of uh, fragmentation or, or deterioration you're gonna see from them. Um, this, is, this just gives a sense of kind of common product and what type of plastic uh, they come from. Um, the type of uh, product can be, um, determine of whether it's more insidious or not. Um, some of these products tend to float more than others. Um, some tend to sink uh, and uh, they tend to um, gather in different places. And so, you know, this will be important as we kind of get into the solutions section later on. But the properties of these plastics um, are instructive of where you find them and also of uh, what the solution can be to mitigate them. So 
So how long until plastic disappears? Um, folks are probably already familiar with this. Um, I think folks are probably going to be pretty sophisticated with this, but um, plastic doesn't technically ever fully biodegrade. Um, because of the heating and the chemical bonds that are caused um, by the thermoplastic creation process, um, the environment, natural processes can't ever actually break those bonds fully. Um, so they just continue to break down more and more and more in the environment um, through weathering processes. And um, you'll see here a variety of products and estimated times that it would take them to degrade in the environment. Now, these can vary depending on how much weathering there is, where this thing gets deposited, where it gets carried to in the water column. Um, so, but these can all be sources of microplastics, of course, except for the, the non-plastic items like the apple core and the socks and things. Um, but um, so whether it's, um, you know, primary microplastics as they call them, which are uh, mostly don't, uh, have been uh, removed from the economy um, or are being phased out of the economy. Those things are like microbeads that you would find in personal care products. Um, if there are any of those out there, you know, that would be something to avoid for sure. Um, those would be pri primary microplastics. That is, they were created at, um, you know, five millimeters or smaller. So microplastic is defined as five millimeters or smaller. Um, and, um, you know, secondary microplastics is anything that degrades over time. <clears throat> so which plastics float in which sink? So you'll see these various kinds of plastic and um, they have different properties. So this is, this is important um, because they get deposited in different places in the environment. Um, those bottle caps might float on the surface and you might be able to skim them off the surface. Um, those polyethylene uh, terephthalate soft drink bottles unfortunately are denser um, and they can sink to the bottom. Unfortunately, as things sink to the bottom in the ocean or in a river, it gets cold, it gets dark down there, there's much less weathering process happening there. So that's actually going to take much longer for that thing to uh, degrade than something that might sit on the surface for a long time. This will also come into play as we talk later on about mitigation strategies and wastewater treatment. So keep this in mind as we go on. So a couple of broad questions here. How can New Yorkers understand and address plastic pollution in waterways? And what can citizens and public managers do to support the mitigation of microplastic pollution? This is a couple of things we're going to address. I have um, a few more slides to get through and then um, I welcome questions on these topics. And you know, it's a, it's a big complex issue. And I think like, as I said, there's, there's a number of strategies uh, required to address it. Um, just as an example, up until recently, Dutchess County, uh, Dutchess County banned uh, plastic bags in January. Um, but up until then, about 100 million uh, single-use plastic bags were used annually, um, and that's just in this county. Um, so, you know, when you see that, um, you know, those, those numbers of the microplastics found in our waterways, you know, it, they seem high, but with the amount of plastics that we use all the time, um, it begins to, to be much more uh, realistic. Um, as we talked about, surface pollution is the, you know, causes about 80% of the plastic pollution. So how does that happen, right? Um, it blows off of the streets, it's overfilled trash cans, um, it's all of the things that, that you can see here. Um, these things ultimately end up in the storm drains. Um, and through this whole process of um, being weathered and being carried through the environment, um, they break down, they, the, the bonds tend to break, they just physically uh, you know, break down a little bit and um, eventually become smaller. So uh, this is an estimate that comes out of um, Pace Law and Roger Williams, uh, that one load of laundry can produce 700,000 synthetic microfibers. So as, you know, coming back to that, um, that number that we saw, the 300 million uh, per day in the Hudson River. Keep in mind that the Hudson River has about 32 combined sewer overflows, uh, outflows between Albany and the New York City. So if you're not familiar, CSO is a wastewater treatment plant that um, 
when there's more than an inch or two of rain in a short period of time, it will overwhelm the, the pipes in the treatment plant, and so the, the raw effluent will go into the, um, into the, the waterways. Um, and existing uh, water treatment does um, take out a significant amount of microfibers, but if the water is untreated, then it's going back into the system um, and can, you know, you, you know, you begin to see how, um, how many fibers could end up in the environment, um, given that so much of our clothing does have um, some synthetic uh, fiber in it. Um, it's important to keep in mind here too that, um, you know, it doesn't need to be washed in order for fibers to come off. As we'll see later, um, fibers can be released, released from your clothes um, in any uh, case, just through the wind or, you know, just like they're in the air. So, um, so there are multiple vectors for uh, microplastics entering the environment. So what happens when it enters the environment, um, it also has the potential to enter the bodies of animals and humans. So here's an example of the uh, food chain, a food chain in the Hudson River watershed, and your food chains around the state probably look very similar with slight differences in the species here. Um, there have been documented cases in the oceans of uh, plankton uptaking microfibers. So um, you can find these uh, pictures online of um, plankton trying to ingest a microfiber and it getting stuck in the, in the plankton. And um, that really, you know, as many of you have probably seen these photos of birds in, in the ocean um, whose bellies are full of like macroplastic, like lighters and things like that, um, because they're, they're attracted to them. This is the, this is the other um, vector for microplastics where it just makes its way up um, through, the, through the food chain. Um, and as people are probably familiar with bioaccumulation, as you know, a fish eats uh, you know, a certain amount of phytoplankton, it gathers and concentrates a lot more of that material in itself, and that um, process continues up the food chain. So what about human health, right? So there are several vectors here, and as I, as I mentioned, um, you know, clothing uh, can uh, release these particles into the air. You see those microfibers kind of floating above the person's head there. Um, and this is true, you know, I've seen a statistic recently that um, humans consume up to a credit card's worth of, of plastic a day. I don't think it's quite that, um, I don't think it's quite on that scale, um, but you know, it's, it's certainly possible that, that this is a significant daily uh, intake at this point. And you know, keep in mind that research on this is still very new and there is uh, not enough information yet for uh, scientists to be able to say with confidence what the effects uh, on the human body are because we've only really started studying this in the past 10 years in the environment and only on human health maybe in the past three to five years. So there's not enough data yet to create a longitudinal study with, with conclusions about, uh, about this. But we know because of other types of uh, particulate pollution and contamination effects um, that we've seen in the past, you know, we, we are, scientists are watching out for these types of effects where um, these tiny uh, these tiny particles uh, floating in our waterways tend to attract uh, contaminants, uh, you know, hydro, hydrophobic contaminants, um, which will attach to uh, these little, you know, microparticles. And then trophic transfer is a reference to the, uh, the food webs, uh, you know, up through the food chain. And then, you know, a human will eat fish or even rice or lots of other canned food. As we're finding out um, daily, they're finding more and more of this stuff in our, in our food chain, uh, human food chain, as well as the environment. Um, and then what, what could be the, the effects of that? Well, the plastic itself, um, that, that, particulate in your body may have some physical effect. Um, it may not, but if it carries with it these contaminants, then it could really have, you know, these other um, more grave implications. But again, more study is, is needed on that. So that's the bad news, right? <laughs> uh, that now's the part where we talk about what can we do. Um, one of my favorite charts is the uh, US EPA uh, pollution reduction uh, triangle. Um, this starts at the top with the most effective things that you can do 
um, at the top, and then sort of the least effective at the bottom. Um, the top is talking about source reduction and reuse. So um, what would that mean in this case? That would mean less plastic going into the environment, right? That would mean that 80% of plastic that is coming off of the surface, you know, runoff, uh, it would be reducing that. Um, recycling and composting, um, recycling still has a, a huge role to play here. Um, and um, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but, um, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle is still um, a, a very important mantra. Um, at the bottom there, you'll see treatment and disposal. So that, that's the kind of thing that after it's in the environment, then we're going to collect it, we're going to trawl it, and we're going to, you know, that's the kind of thing that it requires kind of the most energy um, and it has kind of the least effect just because, you know, your, your effect is temporary. You're going to clean those things up, but those beaches or those waterways are going to be fouled again in a small amount of time. However, I don't want to just leave that aside and say that's not, um, not effective or not important. Again, I think a whole suite of uh, solutions here is warranted. So local solutions, um, alternative single-use products. So we'll talk a little bit about um, what are the other options for uh, true biodegradable plastics. Um, there are some folks coming up with um, alternative options, and I think that we should see a lot more investment in that, and that would go a long way. Um, with the current pandemic situation, um, single-use products are probably not going away anytime soon. Um, so the, uh, the mindset of, you know, we certainly need to reduce the amount of single-use behavior that we have, um, but knowing that it can only go so far and that people's precautions are going to be there, um, and that certain things are single use by definition, like certain medical devices and things like that. Um, those alternative, fully biodegradable, single use products are really important. Um, cleanups on waterways. Again, this is, um, you know, th this might be the bottom of the pyramid, but we do this here all the time. Um, we have River Keeper here, which is the annual river sweep. Um, you know, thousands of tons of plastic trash has been pulled out of the Hudson River. And that does have a great positive effect. I mean, certainly right here on Dennings Point, we have a north-facing beach, and it gets covered with, with macroplastic, um, you know, every, every month, you know. So we try to do cleanups um, as much as we can here. And those things really, you know, they are effective. Um, you know, they may not be a systemic, you know, uh, change, but, um, but they, are, they are effective. Um, personal behavior, again, of reducing single-use uh, uh, behavior, um, wastewater treatment, there are some options there that we'll talk about, um, and uh, business participation as well. Um, it's important to have people on board in terms of these innovations and supporting these kinds of um, evolutions of our economy so that we can have a healthier environment. Reduce, reuse, recycle, like I said. Um, so this is just kind of um, reiterating those um, personal behaviors that can really um, be effective here. And this is one of the things I like about the microplastics issue because um, there really is a lot that a single person can do um, to support this, even if you, know, you aren't setting policy or things like that. Um, you are able to really influence this. Um, and as you talk to others in your circles and your family and your friends, um, you know, limiting these kinds of things or, um, you know, highlighting when you see an overflowing trash can, contacting whoever that is who owns that trash can or something like that. You know, these kinds of things, personal actions really can go um, a long way with this. So here's, again, personal, personal actions, ways to unpackage your life. Um, this is something that probably most people will be familiar with, but um, no disposable straws and bringing your own cup, that kind of thing. Um, these kinds of things really can go a long way, the shopping bag. And, and there have been bag bans now, and so some of this stuff, some of the policy is beginning to catch up with personal behavior. But again, I think that personal behavior has led this issue um, in a lot of ways. And I think that as much as people can continue to do that, um, we'll continue to make progress. This just shows um, the kinds of effect. Um, so if you don't believe me about, you know, one, one replacing one disposable cup uh, for a day one, for one year, 
um, can have this huge uh, effect, right? 16 pounds of solid waste that you're, that you're keeping from uh, going into the environment. Um, more information on this you can find at rethinkdisposable.org and then greenpeace.org uh, has a great uh, place to look at um, what is my plastic footprint. So that can help you kind of identify, you know, sort of indirect effects. So looking again at lo local solutions, um, and I, I know I've got about uh, five minutes left here. Um, local solutions, again, these are, these are things sort of at the bottom of that pyramid, but look at how effective they can be, right? These, these things can really collect an enormous amount of, uh, of trash in a small amount of time. Um, and citizens can participate in this type of thing by advocating for this kind of thing. Um, and then working on, you know, volunteer teams to help um, load this stuff out. This is also something that can be, you know, advocated at municipal or county government levels. Um, looking at stormwater and wastewater retrofits, these things are fairly, there's a couple of, the range here from fairly simple to much more complicated. Um, just grates over your, um, you know, your, your outflows here. Um, can be very helpful, the nets over those outflows. Um, of course, they have to be regularly collected at that point, but, um, but these are ways of kind of putting that stock gap in, in place. Um, there's also an example here of like a centrifuge um, that would be able to, uh, to reduce a lot more of that kind of heavier stuff that, that falls to the bottom. Here's some success stories. You know, again, we talk about that bottom of the pyramid that collecting once it's in the environment, but um, the estuary program, New York, New Jersey uh, floatables program has actually really started seeing a downward trend in the amount of um, uh, floatable debris that they're seeing in their waterways um, based on the, uh, their, uh, their skimming project. So this skimming project going on year on year on year, um, eventually they have started to see some um, some reduction here. Now, the reduction could be attributed to, you know, other things like behavior or other things uh, as well, but it, there is, it's good to see that there is some uh, success stories out there, some positive progress that can be made. Um, in terms of a, a more systemic, and this is like a little bit more of an institutional uh, solution, uh, membrane bioreactors, this is something that our Clarkson University uh, wastewater treatment engineers um, like to talk about. This is one of the best, um, and as far as the scientific literature, this is one of the best um, possible uh, solutions for a treatment plant. Um, if you're going to do like a, wet, a retrofit to a treatment plant, um, these tend not to be too expensive to install, but they're a little bit expensive on the energy side to, to run. Um, so again, alternatives needed, and this is, you know, not to endorse a product, I've never used this product, but this is a company that's based right here in Beacon. Um, Lollyware that is using um, seaweed to um, create a new kind of plastic. So 100% plant-based plant -based food grade materials um, that can disappear through composting or natural processes. So this is just to say that, you know, another future is possible, right? Like we, we have the ability to do this. So to the extent that folks can find and support these alternatives, um, that's, that can be very important. Um, this Single use does not necessarily have to mean uh, generating an unending amount of uh, debris that never disappears, right? So, um, and I mentioned a couple of these things before, um, packaging, paint, medical devices, um, these things that um, we depend on kind of for our health and for cleanliness, um, that there, there are other options. Um, on the regulatory side, we've seen bag bans. Um, other options to explore for communities might be a total maximum daily load for plastics and trash or, or floatables on, on rivers. Um, there are ways in which the MS4 uh, regulatory um, structure can be used uh, uh, to enforce this. And we may see more of this kind of thing happening in the future. And this comes back to kind of business participation as well in that um, it's always good if the economy can kind of get a little bit ahead of regulatory, um, you know, measures that may come down so that if there is a, you know, limit on the amount of floatable trash that uh, gets placed on a waterway, um, everybody in those communities, those, you know, industries that, that use that waterway um, can kind of get on board to support that um, before that kind of regulation goes into place. Um, 
so and this is this is one I want to just focus on the the, uh, the watershed model for trash deb debris and plastic. This is another way that the community can um, help to contribute to this is if we create a model in your watershed of where the worst hotspots are of where trash, debris, plastic, and microplastics seem to be entering the water column, um, whether that's whether we decide that's because of microfibers that are coming out of the, the treatment plants or we decide that that's surface pollution that's coming through um, the, you know, the pipelines, um, the outflows, you know, whatever it is, if we're able to identify those things, then we can intervene in those hotspots and kind of make the most economical uh, interventions possible. So communities can help with this, citizen scientists can help with this. Um, so your personal behavior is really big and then participating in those cleanups um, and, and just observing and helping to uh, determine where the worst spots are so that um, then we can advocate for solutions that are as economical as possible and that have the biggest effect as possible. Other solutions that, um, that we talk about here, we engage, um, you gotta engage the next generation with the education, um, hands-on, solution-oriented things that um, that's sort of what we focus on with those high school students, as you saw, so they can actually see that. Um, and uh, empowering people to kind of clean this stuff up in their own communities, arts communication, as I mentioned. In a sort of macro sense, you know, again, in innovating the U.S. recycling industry um, and eventually creating a circular plastic economy. Um, there's also other innovations out there like plastic to fuel. There are some technologies that are turning plastic waste into energy, which is exciting. Um, and then true bioplastics like the seaweed uh, lollyware that I mentioned that, that actually compost. So that's where I uh, that's where I will end uh, my welcome your questions and thank you everyone for uh, for listening. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Asher. Uh, so if you have questions, please type them into the chat box. We do have a few here that we'll uh, start getting to. Um, I always joke that those of us who work in sustainability are really fun to have at parties because we're always, <laughs> we always have the latest information and things on our minds. And this is an area that I had not really thought much about, um, especially the um, comment you made about how people have estimated that we're consuming a credit card's worth of plastic a day. Um, but, you know, I guess we eat eight spiders a year, so it's uh, <laughs> a lot of stuff we're consuming. Um, so let's get to the, let's get to some of the questions here. Um, uh, the first one we have is similar to HEPA filters for air particles. Is there any kind of a standard for water filters that's been developed that is effective in trapping microplastics for non-commercial use? I am so glad you asked. Um, again, um, this is a product that I don't use my use uh, myself, but has been developed by a company, uh, the Ro the Ro Project, which um, studied microfibers in the, the Hudson River. They have something called the Cora Ball. It's uh, C-O-R-A. Uh, it um, it's kind of like a rubber ball that would go in your, uh, I believe it's your washing machine and, um, and maybe your dryer as well, but um, can collect uh, fibers and as it goes through the cycle, um, Pawed out and it's kind of, it just kind of attracts um, these fibers, I think, through static. Uh, and um, so, yeah, so there are, you know, that's a very kind of like hyper personal um, uh, way that you might be able to reduce your plastic footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned um, plastic to fuel or plastic to energy. Um, what does that entail? So, that's one that I'm not, you know, I haven't done a deep dive on. Um, there are there are companies that are developing uh, technologies to do that. I, I'm not super um, aware of the details. I think that they are, you know, these are these are projects that are still kind of in trial phases. Um, and uh, if you are interested, you could definitely email me. I can send you um, a couple of the links that I have. Um, but um, those projects, as far as I can tell, very much um, in development still. Um, there's another project that I'd mentioned. Uh, it's not, not necessarily a fuel project, but um, there's a research group, I think, in Germany that found a worm that actually has evolved to digest plastics, like the only uh, organism on Earth that can actually digest plastics and break them down into um, component organic uh, molecules. So, 
So there might be, but they're just at the very beginning of that research. And so there's a couple of these kind of emerging technologies that are just very, which is very much at the beginning of the um, of the process there. So as far as like you know having you know, see or a, or a you know complete tech fix, yeah, I don't think we're there yet. But uh, but I'd be happy to uh, to share some information. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question here, do you know how much microplastics accumulate in groundwater and well water is compared to uh, surface waters? Sure. So um, it has been found in groundwater. Um, I don't know about a, like a comparative percentage, but um, it is going to be lower um, than you will find uh, with the surface waters, um, partially because of the, you know, the particles that could travel underground um, and because of the floatability as I mentioned before so those heavier particles um, are going to tend to to gravitate more uh, in the in the water table and uh, there have you know, there have been found um, you know examples of micro in those in those areas you know keep in mind that um, if a bird eats uh, uh, you know, something with microplastics in it, and then the the bird poops near some place with a watershed that, you know, eventually that water, you know, goes into the groundwater. Um, that is another way that these things get transported. So you, even if you live on a pristine piece of land um, without any plastic pollution around you, it's, it's very possible that you'll find, you know, these particles there. Um, they can travel in the air. Um, so, so they have been found in groundwater. I, you know, that's I'm going to make a note to do some more research in that in that area. But it would be it would definitely be less than you would find in, in surface waters. But microplastics have been found present basically in every um, ecosystem on the globe, including Antarctica, and so uh, they really are pervasive. Mm -hmm. uh, and just a comment here: we have had a lot of questions about the recording of this or the slides. Uh, the recording will be posted on the Green New York website. Uh, and that is ogs.ny.gov slash green ny, all one word. And the next question we have here, do plastics that sink to the bottom of the ocean have less of a uh, microplastic environmental impact than plastics that float near the surface? Um, so not necessarily. Um, if I understand, in the question you're asking if, if the dense if the denser plastics um, have as much of a of an effect um, I would say you know the example that we used um, ter phthalate PETE -E, or PET as you see uh, printed on the water ball or soda ball um, that was the densest one that we looked at and um, that is one of the most commonly used plastics so that is um, you know a very you know that that does break down, um, and um, I think that just illustrates that illustration was just to show that basically, if plastic makes it out to the ocean where it can really sink low water table, and um, you know, like in a river, there are episodic events where most of the deposited, say, on the north shore of Dennings Point here, um, will happen during an episodic event. And episodic events, um, or a big rainstorm, or anything like that, um, churn up the, the bottom of uh, a river. And so, even if um, even if that right floats to the bottom of the river, it's going to get churned up, and it's going it's to go back into the water column um, with any kind of uh, significant event like that. Um, and it will get beaches, and it will, you know, you know, float on the surface for a while, and, and get out to the ocean eventually. So, um, so those. Things you know, and and you know, also keep in mind that um, your benthic, you know, macroinvertebrate uh, population, you know, your tiny organisms that live in the substrate or the bottom of the river, um, you know, as they consume those things that are sitting down there, um, they are, you know, that that eventually makes it up to the food chain. So I wouldn't necessarily say they're they're less damaging. Um, I think there's potential there. If I understand your question, there's potential there, like. If you were to be able to find a hot spot where a lot of the plastic is settled to the ocean floor, of maybe cleaning up patches like that, because you probably have patches like this um, on the ocean floor, just like you have like those. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a uh, a comment. Um, 
uh, microfibers and uh, all of the PPE that is going on with the uh, ongoing COVID situation here, a lot of disposable masks and gloves and things like that. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what you've seen in terms of the rivers you've been looking at and the microfiber potentials of those? Mm, that's a great question. You know, I had not. It's a great, it's a great question. Um, and um, it's a, it's an intense time. I will say, you know, just um, being a caretaker of the, the park here, I, I never saw uh, medical masks uh, as part of the trash on the before, but in the past uh, several months, that's it's become a it's become a common uh, piece of trash to find on our trails now. Um, usually, you'd find you know doggy bags and you know, um, bottles and things like that. Um, now we find masks on the trails pretty regularly. So, you know, as certainly as the use of these things increases, um, people drop them, they fall out of their hand, they fall out of their pocket, and you know those things um, they they are probably going to add to the to the load. Um, on the environment, um, but you know, as far as alternatives in that case, um, you know, I think obviously we have a way to go. So I don't have a ready solution for you. Mm -hmm. um, has there been any research on accumulations in headwaters versus drainage areas? For example, the Upper Hudson's headwaters in the Adirondack versus uh, the Hudson River down near New York City. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, as you see, you know. Um, as you look at these um, these uh, research papers, uh, there is, I will say, much more work being done in the lower Hudson um, and the upper Hudson. Uh, but they do, it, it, as much as they find, they do find instance in every single um, tributary of the Hudson. So, um, there was a student here at Marist that studied five tributaries of the Hudson, um, basically found that each, every single, not only does every tributary um, have microplastics in it, but every single sample that he took had microplastics in it, had some amount of microplastic in it. So that's, an, that's a really intense um, thing to consider. And I think that is true of uh, headwaters as well. Uh, I find that, um, these microfibers float on the air. They, they travel just as easily as the water. Um, so it's definitely, it's definitely less. And certainly, like, as I mentioned, it varies with population. So certainly as you get north of Albany and Troy, Schenectady, um, those things are going to be, um, it's going to be less. Um, we'll say though, you know, consider the Mohawk River, um, which is you know, just, just west of, the, of Albany, the capital region. Um, Mohawk River, there's been some great work done by Union College um, over there, um, and found a ton of fibers and beads and fragments um, that floating in, in the Mohawk as well. So, um, so there are, you know, these varying inputs from, from different tributaries, and it's certainly less, but there's less possible. Um, for the most part, yeah, the headwaters, it's going to be, it's going to be less, but I would, I would venture a guess that you will still find it in nearly every sample. Mm -hmm. So you just mentioned something there, and this uh, gets to another question that we got here is, um, microfibers or can they be airborne and are there any risks of breathing them in? Yes. Yes, we bring them in all the time. Um, you know, if you wear, uh, I used to have a really cheap uh, fleece uh, uh, of, uh, uh, jacket, like a piece of clothing, and you could actually see the, the kind of like puffs that would come off it. Um, and, uh, you know, this is true on a, on a smaller scale of um, almost polyester clothing um, and um, some of the most recent work on microplastics is uh, is the airborne uh, microplastics um, in fact if uh, share with Brendan I think the most recent one was a study done in national parks out west and they're finding um, you know floatable uh, they're fine they just put out um, uh, collection pans out in the middle of national parks. And they found significant amounts of um, landing on these, you know, small uh, collection pans that they put out there. And so, I mean, it's, it is absolutely happening. And um, most of us are probably doing it for most of our lives. We've probably been breathing it in. Um, but as I mentioned, the, um, the science is really just catching up to that. Um, it's really 
hard to see these things. Um, these might bridge on being called nanofibers uh, or, or nanoplastics. Um, I didn't can, uh, you know, address that necessarily specifically, but when you get down below uh, a certain uh, size, it's almost it's difficult to, uh, to observe, let alone identify um, the nanoscale plastic. Um, and so, you know, you may not even notice these kinds of things um, entering. Um, and as I said, you know, there we're still, you know, science is still out on, on what the health effects of those things are, but um, almost guaranteed that, yeah, you're already breathing this stuff in. All right, so no longer breathing, no longer drinking. Um, and now this, this is just kind of going down the rabbit hole here because I find it interesting. So most skin creams and lotions come in plastic containers. Is there the ability for fibers to shed off that into the cream that gets absorbed into the skin too? Hmm. Um, for the most part, no. Um, in terms of that type of plastic, um, that tends to be that low density, um, uh, like, which holds together pretty well unless it's like really under some kind of weathering. Um, what I will say is probably people are aware that fibers are kind of bottled water that's sold around the world. Uh, fibers have been found in um, your tap water, and every kind of bottled water. Um, there is um, some belief in the research community that some of the fibers that are found in those water bottles are coming off of the water bottles themselves. Um, and that's probably due to, you know, um, sunlight, weathering, you know, just physical, um, you know, abrasion, that kind of thing that happens. Um, uh, and then maybe just the quality of plastic varying uh, as well. But that's the only product I'm aware of that, like, it's been shown that it sort of directly sloughs off into the product. Um, as far as the personal care product, I don't, I don't believe so. But I haven't seen any research on it. Okay. Um, so the next question here, is there anything that somebody can do about laundry? Are there any kind of cycle changes? Um, doing less loads, if that helps or not, cold or warm. Um, I think you mentioned there was a product out there, some sort of ball that people could potentially look at. Um, is there anything they can do that's simple in their own home? Right. Um, so the Coral Ball, again, yeah, C-O-R-A, uh, the Coral Ball is something that, um, that can help. Um, it's in, I think that um, the best thing that you can do is try to purchase more natural fibers is try to wear more natural fibers um, and try to um, you know uh, then those would be the things going into your laundry uh, production. it's pretty difficult um, to see how we could use the uh, fiber um, fibers coming off of uh, synthetic clothing you know, a textile expert though and um, there are probably Again, this is a, an opportunity, an industry opportunity for people in the industry. Maybe there are weaves, maybe there are methods that would be um, that would be better for um, you know holding those on the clothing better. You know, um, maybe some uh, processes that could be uh, more effective at creating poly clothing that do not um, slow off as much. But as far as um, on the person. As far as I know, other than the kind of the core ball, um, you know, maybe there's a kind of a filter you can buy. I don't know. But, um, you know, other other than that, it's natural fibers. You know, as you saw in the early slides, you know, wool uh, will break down within one to five years in our environment. Um, it's an organic uh, you know, molecule, so it's um, much less problematic. Mm. What is the biggest change you've made in your own life to reduce plastic use? That's a great question. Um, I think that the biggest change um, for me, um, well, until recently, um, was bringing my own uh, bottle of Dunkin' Donuts every day um, because I am uh, I'm an admitted uh, coffee addict, and uh, that was kind of my um, you know, biggest sort of single use um, before I adopted like a, just a reusable bottle. And if people don't know, um, you know, Yes, before the pandemic, you were allowed to bring your own um, to Dunkin' Donuts and they would just fill it up for you. I think a lot of folks didn't even know that. Um, of course, now they have um, they have disallowed that. 
Um, so I've begun, I guess now what I do, I've begun making a lot more coffee at, at home, um, which is not as good, but you know, the, the, the prices we pay. Um, but so, so I think that's, you know, just reusables um, is really big. Um, a really big aspect. I try to just, in general, reusable bags, reusable cups. I know it sounds simple, and I know it's one of those things that's been out there for a long time, but it's also one of those things that um, it does require a little bit of like thinking ahead and, and kind of personal organization, kind of thinking through your day or your week before you go out, making sure those reusable things with you um, when you go to the stores. Those, you know, have become an issue now. Um, but um, for me, I would say, yeah, that's kind of the I guess thing that I've done. Um, other than you know, just spreading the word and sharing sharing this knowledge with other people, which you know I would definitely encourage everybody um, to do. That um, everyone is an educator. That's an attitude that we have here at Beacon Instruction. Um, it's one of the principles we live by. And um, you know I think that um, talking about this stuff and just noticing it and um, helping other people find those solutions as well is is also a huge impact that you can have too. That really geometrically um, enhanced. Yeah, I completely agree with that. One of the things that I did last year around holiday time is I uh, put together little um, utensil kits for people and to them as part of uh, holiday gifts. And uh, there's some folks that, you know, are not, um, you know, don't do a lot for the environment on a regular basis, don't talk about it, and they've uh, become enamored with them. And they've told me about them and done other things. So even the small uh, thing that you can do for somebody uh, or talk about can have a big impact. Yeah. Reusable straws, reusable straws are great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got time for just a couple more questions here and they keep coming in. Um, did the Roselia Project release a report on their Hudson River study? Yes, they did. Um, you, I believe you can find it from their website. If, um, if you find it, just let me know. Um, Rachel, who runs the project, is a wonderful person, very open, and um, they're based in Vermont. And uh, we're hoping to collaborate with them um, on future projects. So um, if you are interested in more uh, information from them, um, yeah, just let me know, and I'd, I'd be happy to get that to you. But um, yes, I do believe that they, uh, that they published that. I don't have it necessarily right at my my fingertips, but um, but you can you can find a lot of these reports out there. Um, New York, New Jersey, Baykeeper was the other one um, that did a big report. I think it was um, with the Lamar Institute. They studied the the bay in the the New York City harbor. Um, Rosalia, I believe, did the whole column. So if you're curious about north of Albany, I believe they did go north of Albany um, as well and did the entire Hudson River, like from like Mount Marcy all the way down to the bay. Um, they were primarily focused on fibers, but um, they, uh, so that's, that's a good one. Um, Clearwater, I mentioned, uh, Riverkeeper as well. So um, there are a bunch of studies out there. Um, and if folks are interested in the primary research documents, feel free to reach out to me and I can, I can share those with you. Mm -hmm. And the final question we've got time for here today is, um, can you uh, repeat the website where people can go to learn more about their plastic footprint? And do you oh, yes thoughts on doing kind of a plastic audit? Well, I know we usually talk about waste audits, but uh, if you have any for folks on specifically looking at their plastic use. Um, I love the plastic audit question. That sounds like a great opportunity space. Um, but it was greenpeace.org. Um, and I think if you just Google uh, plastic footprint or what is my plastic footprint, um, it was greenpeace.org that had that. Uh, Rethinkdisposable.org is another one that has a great um, website about um, things that you can do in your own life um, to reduce uh, that single-use behavior. And um, also really interesting because they have those infographics about the kind of impact that you can have, um, the kind of impact that that does have. Remember, like I said, like if you just avoid one single-use cup a day, that's 16 pounds of trash for a year. Um, and that's, again, something that you can share with other people um, you know, those are great stats that you can share with people because that single thing is just that it's sort of that thing that you can do every day and it doesn't seem like a big thing. But when you communicate um, the positive effect that you can have by changing their behavior, um, that can be re really powerful. So I encourage, um, yeah, both of those websites. Um, but I love the idea of a plastic audit. That's something, I'll write that down too. Um, 
And um, just thank you everybody for your great questions. And this has been um, really good for me uh, as, as well to participate in this. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, presenting. This was fantastic and for staying around for the questions. Uh, we had quite a bit of really good engagement today. Uh, and for everybody, um, thank you for joining. We do have our next Lunchtime Learning uh, Series coming up again. That's August 11th. That's a Tuesday at noon, and that's going to be on greener garment cleaning. So mark your calendars. Thanks, Asher, and thanks a lot, everybody. Have a good one. Thanks, Brandon.